Welcome to Passport to Your Thoughts. You are joining a three-part series, and today we're going to start one up with um, the story and giving you your passport that you can discover and travel. And today it's going to be looking at discovering your baseline to your thoughts. And when I talk about the baseline, there's a little bit of what I can get to other coaching and information on the baseline, and that's really just like what's your new goal? Where are you starting from? And I think for many of us, when it comes to issues, um, whether it's bound here, or the pelvis, or the back, we don't know where an understanding of what our number is in the world is an issue or a problem. You know, we don't know our system of rehab or treatment or CBT, what it is that we're looking to get back to, what our baseline or our original was. So I want to help you establish what your baseline is and then the specific way of helping. So before I move on a little bit further, I wanted to give a brief introduction of who I am. So my name is Macy Rizzolo, but I also go by Rizzolo Macy. And I'm based out in Oakland, California in the Bay Area. And I'm orthopedic as well as a pelvic health physical therapist. And I have a passion um, for pelvic health. This due to a big part of my own past and history around my pelvic floor mission, my goal is I want to bring that education along that whole body of issues through self-care and then also the movement, which I really love and it's really good for everyone. So we'll jump right in. Um, also as a just for an understanding of how the series will go, and again I mentioned there's three parts to it. Um, so this third part is establishing your baseline. The second will be looking at our support system um, and stabilization system for our pelvis. And then the third is going to be looking at more of the functions of our pelvis. So we'll see that this this big series is going to look at the pelvic health. And what we'll be doing, or what I will be doing, but what I'll be doing to bring it together is at least 10 minutes of lecture, talk, um, just so that you have um, a good understanding of where we're starting from. And then the next 10 minutes will be more of an explanation of the movement practice or will be um, a sensorial type of practice. So, Bear with me at least for the 10 minutes, and hopefully this will um, be some good information for you. So I will also have my notes and things for you um, as, as we go along. So I wanted to at least start off in um, talking about, I want to bring us back to an understanding of our baseline. And depending on where you are in your life stage, it's going to change over time, and I think that when you go through those various life stages, so whether you know you're watching this um, as a teen and you're going through puberty, or if um, you're a new mom and you just had a baby, then obviously it's going to be very different. The things that um, have shifted and changed in your pelvis compared to pre-pregnancy and then post-pregnancy, and the same thing also with menopause. And this also goes for men as well too, even though they not a lot of life transitions that we're really physically seeing, but you know, compared to when you're in Aki, when you're in your 20s, and then you know, going through midlife or you're in your 40s or your 50s, a lot of things will just change and shift. So it's important to know what your baseline is. So I'm going to start off with um, the bony pelvis, and I think it's important to understand um, this part of our body and also know what these parts are, and not asking to be an anatomy geek like me, but if you were to have to go to the doctor, I think it's important to be able to talk to your doctor and point out, you know, this part of my body is hurting or this part of my body is hurting, and then you're just a better advocate for yourself, so where you're getting a lot of help in your hands and not just what the doctor is doing. So we'll start off with the um, bony pelvis, and um, again, we'll do this for the initial part, and that will be um, for the second half of the first half. I'm just going to show you what's going on. So we have our pelvis, and I want to actually differentiate the difference between our hips and our pelvis. So most people, when they say like, I'm using my hands and my hips, they're actually putting it on um, what we call the iliac crest. And so our hip is actually, um, so here you have, um, this is just the cutout portion of it, but here you have your femur bone. And so um, you also have um, a bony outgrowth, which is your greater trochanter. And then this is your pelvic bone. So you have two sides of your, of your pelvis. And so then your hip joins 
actually then meets inside of the aqua cavity or the hole of your pelvis. And when we talk about the hips, then it's actually talking about this lower part of our range. And again, we'll feel that on ourselves in a little bit. But when we're talking about the pelvis, it's actually these two bony sides. And so the pelvis is actually made up of three different parts. So we have the ilium, which is the top part. We have the ischium, which is the bottom part. And then we have the pubis, which is right in front of us. And again, we'll feel all of those in a little while. And then if we turn the bony pelvis model around, then we have our sacrum, which is um, sits um, right in the middle, sandwiched in between the two pelvic bones. And then at the bottom part is where you have your coccyx or what we also call the fossa. So that is the bony pelvis. And then we go on to some of your visceral really also talking about your organs. And so inside of our pelvis, and I like to think of it as like a bowl because it almost sits like a bowl, and inside of that bowl we have all of our organs. So I'm going to take out the different um, structures that are in here, and, and so this is um, a female pelvis model, so it's going to be a little bit different than a, a male pelvis. Um, but so I'm going to take out the bladder, which is what we have first. Sorry to say, the bladder just kind of fell apart. But then here we have um, our bladder, and then we have our uterus. We have the vaginal canal, and on either side of the uterus are our ovaries and then the fallopian tubes. And then lastly, we have our rectum. And so we have all of these um, three organs um, present. And then sitting inside of that, so if I were to face that bowl towards you, then you can see all of the different um, muscles that are there. So now we'll go into the musculoskeletal part of the pelvis. And so then right in the middle, then we have our musculoskeletal. Um, and so these are the muscles that have then attachments um, to the bony structure of our pelvis. And I'm not, again, not gonna go into too much um, detail, but the most, um, at least in this layer that you can see, so that's actually the deepest layer. So there's three layers of muscles. So the one that you can see here right now is what we call the levator veni. And so that's what we usually um, almost like talk about as like a hammock or a sling of our pelvis. And then we have a second layer. Unfortunately, I can't take all these layers out, but then we have a second layer. Um, and that second layer actually consists of the urethral sphincter. So we have the bladder here, and then the urethra is um, that little tube um, that where then urine comes out um, through our, um, our opening. And then above that, then we have the two ureters, which um, come out um, from the bladder, which then reach out towards the kidneys. So um, for that second layer, uh, the urethral sphincter, so again, it's just a group of muscles that help to engage, um, but they're both voluntary or both involuntary, that um, help to um, engage those muscles so they prevent urine from leaking or keep from leaking. And then we have our most superficial layer of muscles, which you can actually see here. So again, pointing um, in this direction. So if we were to take off all of the skin, all of the fat, all of the connective tissue, then you can actually be able to see all of the um, external, external as well as superficial muscles here. And then very quickly to go over some of the tissues. So again, this is the female um, pelvis model, but then we have the clitoral hood, and then you have our meat footer, so you can actually little button that's there, but you actually have a little hood that actually sits on top of that. And so in the second uh, second part, we'll actually um, talk a little bit about how you can do a little bit of an experiential um, practice or sensorial practice so that way you can actually feel for all those different structures if you're not too familiar with it. So if you were to actually engage and squeeze your pelvic floor, you would actually see that clitoral hood actually move up a little bit. And that would be the same thing if um, for um, uh, a penis owner, then they would engage their pelvic floor muscles and then you'd see it to actually move for um, a vagina owner, then it would be the clitoral hood that would move to engage your um, pelvic floor muscles. And then you have um, the labia majora, labia minora. So those are, again, just um, the tissue. It's gonna be that most external part vulva that you're going to see before then we get into some of these more internal structures. So that is the, um, the, the bony pelvis and then the 
visceral that we talked about, and then the musculoskeletal things. So hopefully have a good baseline and understanding of what um, all the things that we're going to be talking about. And then for the very second part of the, today's um, class, class, I guess, we'll see. Um, then we're going to start to feel. So we'll start off with the bone pelvis. Um, obviously, we won't be able to feel the organs. Um, I'll talk to you about what you can start doing you know, later on in the day in order to get a sense of at least the superficial muscles. And then we're going to move. So we're going to want to see, you know, what does it look like? What does it feel like? And then how does it move? Okay? All right, so welcome to the second part. Um, so now the experiential practice. So what we're going to do is actually start to feel for our bony pelvis. So I'm going to break it down. It's just going to be fairly elementary. So want to, again, just make sure that it covers the bases. So especially for those of you who've been practice, practicing for a really long time and it feels like you already know this, then great. Then this will be a good um, reminder or practice for you. For those who are new to really discovering this part of their body, then I'm hoping that you'll take some time to really kind of explore and discover. So again, as I mentioned, when I mentioned the bony pelvis in the first part, most people tend to put their, um, their hands on their hips. So what I want you to do, so you can do this either in a um, sitting cross-legged, you can sit um, on a block or on a bolster, uh, you could sit long sitting, so just having your legs out in front of you, or you can even be on your knees. I'm actually gonna be on my knees. Um, it'll be easier for some of the things I wanna show. So you're actually gonna start off um, with putting your hands, what most people would say, on their hips. So here is actually what we call the ilia, the ilia crest or the iliac crest. And as I mentioned that the pelvic bones, they are three different bones that are all fused together for each side of the pelvis. So when you put your hand here, it's actually going to be on your iliac crest. And so then from there, you can just kind of feel for, you know, the density of that bone. You might even feel the difference, you know, so if you're standing, if you're sitting, um, if you're in the kneeling position, you know, feel that maybe one pelvic bone feels a little bit higher than the other one. I know that um, at least from what I'm seeing is that my left side is a little bit higher than my right side. And so noticing for some of those asymmetries, I think is important. Um, and as we you know, go into the movement part of it, and then as we go into the second and the third um, part of the series, it's important to understand like, yes, that there may be asymmetries and knowing why those asymmetries are present, whether it's because of musculoskeletal issues, whether it's because of what's going on you know, with your back, maybe something that's going on you know, with your legs and know how that might have an impact on your yoga practice or your movement practice for sure. So again, so you have that iliac crest and then if you're standing, if you're on your knees, I'm just gonna have you float up a little bit higher. And so now we're going to look for, so now we're actually gonna talk about the hips or the hip joint. So you're gonna actually stick your hips out to one side and I like to make a fist. And so you're gonna do a little bit of percussion. So you're going to percuss just along that iliac crest that you just felt earlier then you're going to percuss a little bit lower so it should feel a little bit different so it should feel a little bit more bouncier because now you're on muscle which is going to be um, the glute so glute me medius is right over here and then you're going to go a little bit lower and now you're going to feel okay now i'm into bone again so that's going to be the greater trochanter so what i showed um, earlier on that bony part of your pelvis so that's going to be more of your hip or your hip where your hip joint is so when people talk about getting a hip replacement surgery, it's in that hip joint that that's where um, they're getting that hip replacement surgery. So it's not, you know, all the way up here. That's going to be your iliac crest. This is going to be um, your hip joint. Okay. So next, um, continuing to work with um, the pelvis. So then you're going to place, you can, you know, put both of your hands again on your iliac crest and then you're going to have your thumbs back behind you. And so if, you know, just to call out some anatomy terms, so then the thumbs usually will then rest on what we call the posterior superior iliac spine. Again, you don't have to worry about what that means, but then that's gonna be really the start of your sacrum. So if you were to then move your thumbs just a little bit closer to each other and then move it a little bit further down, that triangular bone is all of your sacrum. And then if you were to continue, a little bit um, further down, then all the way towards your butt crack, then that's gonna be where your tailbone or your coccyx is located, okay? 
okay? So then you at least have an uh, understanding of what's um, the bony structures behind you, along the sides of your body, and now along um, the front of the body. So you can either do this sitting, or you can do this lying down. If you feel, if you have a little bit of extra flesh that might kind of get in the way, then probably lying down is gonna be a little bit easier just to go and access it. So you're gonna start off with where your belly button is, and then you're gonna walk your fingers all the way from your belly button south until you feel the beginning of, again, another bony structure. And so that's gonna be um, the, pubic, the pubic area, um, or what we also call the pubis. Uh, or um, then right in between that is the pubic symphysis. So I'm just gonna bring, I bring, I have this model right here. So then again, it's those two bones, then they merge towards the center. You have a big layer of connective tissue, which is called your pubic symphysis. And that is what helps to go and fuse um, the bones together, as well as where you have a little bit of um, fusion just along what we call the SI or sacrum, because the sacrum, iliac, the ilium, um, crest, or sorry, the sacroiliac um, joint. So it's going to be the SI joint and then um, this pubic symphysis joint. Okay, so that's going to be the bony, um, bony pelvis experiential feeling for those three to four different parts. So moving on, I'm not going to spend too much time on the musculoskeletal again, just because um, I, as I mentioned, the second part, so we're going to spend a little bit more time with that. But again, I'm going to just bring out this model. So one of the things when I'm talking to my patients that I think is really important is for them to really get a sense of, you know, feeling, seeing what these different parts of their body um, look like, what the tissues look like. So what I recommend is usually getting like a small handheld mirror. If you don't have a handheld mirror, if you have like a full length mirror, um, you want to have that um, propped up so that way you can be able to go and see your genitalia. And so you want to be in a relaxed setting. You want to be in a warm, a comfortable setting, and also a safe setting as well too. So if you have a lot of kids around or if you have roommates, then you want to make sure that, you know, at least the door is locked or let them know that you're going to need a little bit of some privacy as you explore this part of your body. So as I mentioned um, during the lecture part, that obviously you're not going to be able to see all the muscles, but you're going to see a lot of skin, you're going to see some tissue but then it's important for you to then get a sense of what those tissues look like. Again, because we want to establish that baseline of what your normal is. So uh, some of the things that you can start looking for, again, so I'm going to be um, prefacing more toward um, the vagina owner. So that um, particular anatomy is you're going to be looking for the clitoral hood. So again, um, if you can start off with finding your pubic bone, you're going to move a little bit further south and then you're gonna be right at the clitoral hood. So it should be a little bit of um, some tissue that sits right above your clitoris. And so you can just see how it moves. You can you know, have one finger, two fingers on either side, just feel how those tissues move. And then you can um, you know, place your finger on the clitoris and you can also feel for obviously the amount of sensation that's there. And then from that area, then you can either have one finger, two finger on either side or one side, and then you're gonna be moving towards um, labia majora, and so, or also just like the outer lips. And so you move into that area. Again, the size is gonna be very different for everybody, so I don't want you to think that it needs to look a certain way. It's like just like with everybody, we're all unique, so it's gonna be very unique to you as well. And again, same thing. You know, I think that it's important just to look at um, the color, you know, look at what it looks like. Um, again, when we end up having issues, then, you know, we don't even know what our normal is. So again, it's going to be very specific to you, but just noticing, okay, what does, what do my outer lips look like? What do my inner lips look like? Um, and then that area, again, we call that the vulva. Um, and then you can go a little bit further. So then, I don't know if you can see here, but then the first hole that you have is going to be um, your urethra. So as I mentioned, um, for the bladder, you know, urine fills up in the bladder, then it passes out through the urethra. So you can at least get a sense like, okay, that's where my urethra is. And then if you were to move a little bit further south, then you actually see a little bit of a bigger opening and that's gonna be the vaginal canal. And so just noticing all um, three of those structures right there. And then you can move a little bit further south and then you're gonna have um, your anus, okay? And so with anus, then we have, um, we have two sphincters. So 
the internal um, anal sphincter, obviously you can't um, see that one, the external anal sphincter, can't see the one either, but um, just with you actually trying to um, squeeze or like what we call like wink in that area as if like you're trying to prevent yourself from passing gas or from having a bowel movement, then you'll actually see um, those tissues just kind of fold. So you can try that, you know, same thing as you do for doing like a Kegel or a pelvic floor contraction, you're gonna see um, the tissues around there kind of close up. You'll see the vaginal canal also close as well too, um, just by the action of the muscles around that area. And then same thing along um, the anus. And then right in between that structure is what we call the perineum. And so it's kind of almost like a figure eight, essentially. So it's the center of that figure eight of all of those muscles that converge into that area. Then I find it like a really important structure and it's a great way for you to get a sense whether you are getting, you know, um, a decent pelvic floor contraction. So as I mentioned earlier that when you are actually, um, when you're doing uh, a Kegel or doing a pelvic floor contraction that you're using the superficial pelvic floor muscles are squeezing, they're helping to create that squeeze. And you should also see um, a little bit of what we call like puckering or movement there. Um, shouldn't see a bulge. So like if you see a bulge, then it's the opposite of what you want to happen. Again, I'll be talking more about that in the second, um, second part of the series. And then lastly, um, so right around your outer lips, then you can start to just palpate or press into the tissues right around that area. So you have your ischial tuberosity. That was the last thing I forgot to mention was the ischial tuberosity. So that's another um, bone. So you can actually sit, so sorry about that. So you're gonna place your hands underneath your butt. So again, whether you're in, um, in a cross-legged or long sitting, and then I want you to just kind of move or wiggle um, your body around, and then you're gonna feel for your ischial tuberosity. So then that's going to make up the ischium part of that um, three-part fused um, pelvic bone. And so coming back to this, so then you're gonna feel for your ischial tuberosity when you're lying down in a relaxed position, and then you can actually feel for some of the muscles. Sorry, so I have um, my daughter, Grace, she's gonna hang out with um, just for this last portion of um, this video. So as I was um, mentioning was that then you're going to um, feel your hands just along the ischial tuberosity, and then you're going to palpate or press just the muscles that surround your ischial tuberosity, your pubic bone, as well as all the way towards um, your tailbone. And so I like to think of it not so much like as a hammock, and I think like more of a hammock along the, um, the deeper layer, but then actually more of like a trampoline along the superficial layer, just because that muscle needs to be able to, you know, have some give Obviously, every time you're having some type of impact, whether it's coughing, sneezing, laughing, jumping, um, then that trampoline needs to kind of have that type of um, good movement. And also because it's having those muscles, they have attachment along the pubic bone, ischial tuberosity, all the way towards um, the tailbone. And so it's, you know, it covers lots of different areas. So I think it's important that um, you're uh, thinking of it more of like a trampoline, not so much of a hammock because those muscles need to have a lot of resiliency. So now we're gonna get to the moving part. So um, we're gonna start off in a long sitting position. And so long sitting, you're gonna have um, your legs out in front of you. And so we're gonna start off with looking at, again, just the movement of the femur bones or your thigh bones inside of um, your hip joint. And again, we're talking a little bit about the hips, but again, it's important just to kind of get a sense because what's going on in the hips will also have an impact on the pelvis. So you're gonna start off with just um, allowing the leg to windshield wipe. So what we call internal rotation, external rotation. So when the legs um, turn out, then that's gonna be the external rotation. When the legs go in, then that's going to be the internal rotation. And so you can either do one leg at a time or you can do both of them at the same time. You just wanna kinda of see, you know, what is the norm? Do you have more movement from one side to the other? Um, so that's going to be the first part. A lot of these, so I'm going to go through all of the different movements. You're gonna spend a little bit more time just to play with them. If it's helpful, then you can have like a journal or something just to kind of write down and notice um, what you see. And so next we're gonna look at an anterior and posterior tilt. So 
you're gonna have your hands just along um, your iliac crest. And so even before you even start with that, I just want, so just as you're sitting, so whether you're sitting cross-legged, sitting in this position, just notice where you're sitting or what you're sitting on. So we earlier looked for our ischial tuberosity. So just noticing, are you sitting on your sits bones, what is also known as our sits bones, or are you kind of collapsing onto your sacrum? So ideally, if you can try to have yourself sit up, so that way you're on um, your sits bones would be actually a lot better. And the other option is, is that you can sit on a block, you can sit on a bolster, and you're gonna place your ischial tuberosity or your sits bones on there. So if you have a hard time getting into that position, so that way you can kind of fall into that. Okay. And then with that, then you're gonna place your hands um, on your iliac crest, and then you're gonna be moving back and forth into what we call a posterior tilt, because you're allowing the pelvis to move into a posterior backward direction, and then into an anterior tilt. Again, if hamstrings are really tight, you can bend at the knees, or you're just gonna move back and forth into posterior and anterior tilt. So noticing, um, do you have freedom of movement as you go back and forth? Do you have to use your feet in order to help you get the movement? Can you use your core? Because the core does need to happen in order for you to go back into that posterior tilt. You need to have lengthening along the low back to also get into that area. And then also even just the flexibility to get into an anterior tilt. Again, all you're doing is just noticing. So you're just noticing what that feels like. And then also, does it feel different from the right side to the left side? Okay. So from a uh, long sitting position, then we're gonna move into uh, lying on our back and we're gonna look at a couple of different things. So the first one, thing that we're gonna look at is um, hip flexion. So you're gonna lie on your back. I'm gonna just show one side where you're gonna be doing um, both legs. So you're gonna start off with just bringing that leg up, just up into hip flexion. So you're gonna notice, again, when you do this, does it kind of pull you into a posterior tilt? where then that opposite leg needs to bend, or you're able to do it without too much compensation with um, your rib cage or your back, okay? So then from hip flexion, then you're gonna open out into what we call abduction, or just moving the leg out to the side. And again, just noticing does the other leg need to kind of come up, okay? So moving the leg out to the side, bring it up into flexion, then you're gonna bring it across the body. So you can start off with still keeping the hips down, moving it across towards the midline. Again, noticing just like, you know, do muscles feel, you know, particularly tight? And then you can even allow it to cross all the way as you come into a twist, okay? So moving through those four different directions. And then we're gonna bend um, that knee a little bit, and then we're gonna be moving through internal and external rotation of that hip joint. So as that knee moves towards midline, the foot is moving out, so that's going to be your internal rotation. And then as that knee moves out, the foot moves towards midline, that's going to be internal rotation. So feeling again for that ease of movement. Again, all of that you're doing is just really just assessing. You're just noticing what does it feel like as you're moving your limb in all of these different motions. Does it cause any pain? Is it painful in your hip joint? Do you feel like certain muscles? you know, just kind of pulling or tightening, or is it really hard for you to even like hold this position because those muscles are pretty fatigued and working really hard. And then lastly, then you're gonna look at rotation. So then you're kind of combining all of those movements. So then you're gonna start up with that leg up in flexion. You're gonna open it out into abduction. You're going to swing it all the way towards the front, bring it all the way towards the other side, and then all the way back up. So moving that leg, in rotation and again all you're doing is assessing and just noticing what you feel all right so then again you'll do that on both sides just taking note of um, those differences again you're looking just to establish your baseline so next we're going to be going into a prone or onto your belly position so here we're going to be mostly looking at um, our extension in our hip so again, you're gonna be lying um, on your belly. And again, I'm just gonna be demonstrating with my right leg. So when you're doing hip extension, you're looking to try to keep your body fairly still. 
So you can even think, well, actually, before I even say that, so I just want you to just lift your, your leg up. So just noticing as you lift, so keeping your head down and just lifting your leg up and noticing what happens. So um, does your pubic bone uh, press down? Do you engage through your glutes as you do it or not? You know, do you compensate or have to move more through your back because lack of strength through um, your extensors or um, your glute muscles? And then you can bend at that knee, so then you can open the leg out a little bit wider. And now we're going to look at internal and again external rotation. So moving it back and forth, obviously it's going to feel a little bit different compared to when you're on your back. Okay, so again, feeling for internal and external rotation. And again, just noticing what your low back is doing as you're going into all of these movements. I'm just up here so I can talk and you guys can hear me. You're going to be doing this so that way your um, head is completely down on the ground. And then the last position we're going to look at is going to be side lunge. So you're going to be on your side. So again, we're going to look at um, the movement of lifting that leg up and down as well as core stability. Because um, when we talk about the pelvis, we can leave out the core, the core is a huge component of the pelvis and again we'll talk about this more um, in a second as well as the third part of um, the series. So you're going to come into a side lying position, you're going to have that bottom leg bent, top leg is going to be straight and just notice again you know does your body need to kind of shift, does it find it really hard in order to go and stabilize because those core muscles aren't turning on and then with this top leg you're just going to lift it up and you can just notice how high you can get it up into abduction. So then we're also looking at a lot of those internal structures like um, the adductors. Again, they play a huge part in pelvic health and then bringing that leg down. And then um, just because I want to show the adduction or where we're bringing the leg into midline, then the top leg is going to be bent. And then this top, the bottom leg is actually going to lift up. So you're looking to see, do you have the strength to be able to lift that leg up? Another thing that I like um, in order to go and test um, adductor strength is just to lift that top leg up. So here's like where you're going to have to do a lot of balancing. And then the top, or sorry, the bottom leg lifts up. So you're really working on um, getting those inner thigh muscles to work very, very strongly. Okay. So, and then again, just noticing what your core doing. So whether allowing that, um, hand that's supporting you, whether it can let go. All right, so give all of those um, movements a try. Again, this isn't um, an exercise. All it is is for you to kind of establish where you are in all of those movements, comparing it from the right side to the left side. You know, are those muscles really tight? Are they really weak? You know, what those hip joints are doing, what your back is doing, what your core is doing for all of them. So allow this to be um, some a, a chance for you to really explore and dig a little bit deeper because I think from there, as we explore in parts two and parts three, a little bit more about um, your pelvic floor health and then how that really ties into just overall general health um, for the rest of your body in regards to how you're moving and how it speaks to your movement practice and how you can help um, to improve your movement practice just by having a better understanding of how you move in general. So hopefully you enjoyed this first part and I look forward to seeing you in parts two and three. Take care.